So I'm going to call the meeting to order at five o'clock. And our first item for consideration is considering, considering, considering eliminating the zoning board of adjustment and creating a development review board planning commission to present draft resolution, other planning commission updates, action possible. Sandy or Theo, whoever's up. Sandy. I'll start and uh, Theo jump right in when whenever, but um, we presented previously the idea of the Middlesex creating the De development review board to replace the zoning board of adjustment and the planning commission. So with any permitting review, it would be done by one body. That body would be appointed by the select board. Um, and there seemed to be openness to, to doing that for, for Middlesex. Um, so I drafted a resolution based largely on a template that the Vermont League of Cities and Towns has um, for the creation of a development review board with five members and either two or three alternates. And it was also the recommendation of the Planning Commission that the select board appoint one but not more than at least one but not more than two members of the planning commission to serve on the development review board and that's because we've found that it's very helpful that the body that's involved in writing the regulations also has you know some um input or some insight that can be helpful as you're reviewing permits uh so that's the resolution that i drafted for you this can um be effective anytime the select board needs to vote on it. Uh, my recommendation was to take a look at the resolution. If that looks good, um, you know, think about that or decide that now. And then at your next meeting, make the actual appointments and you can fill those in, those blanks in on the resolution. We can certainly pull the planning commission members and see if there are one or two members who are interested in serving and pass on those names to you and then talk to the um, zoning Board of Adjustment and see if there are folks there who want to serve or it's up to the site board. You can put it out for whoever you know, anybody wants to apply and, and seek letters of um, letters of interest and make appointments that way. I didn't want to presume there was one way or another to do that, but just put that out as possibilities. Um, as drafted with five members and two alternates, that would allow each you know, two people from the Planning Commission, three people from the Zoning Board of Adjustment, and then two um, alternates who would be from the Zoning Board of Adjustment. So everybody who serves now could continue to serve if they wanted to. So in thinking about this, and I'm not sure it makes any real difference, but it potentially to me makes it a little cleaner to make this transition effective July 1st at the start of our fiscal year. That way we're not thinking back, when did we actually do this? I don't know how everybody else feels about that. Mm -hmm. And that gives us that gives us a little bit of time to get organized about who the cast of characters uh, is actually gonna be and all of that. So what you're asking us to do tonight is approve the resolution. And then you will come, assuming we do, you will come back to us with a list of potential members <coughs> We will appoint them and then effective July 1st will be in the new world. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I think that works. Um, if you could, you could vote now on uh, 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 the, the text of the resolution and it would be effective July 1st. Um, right. And then sometime between now and then you would have to have another meeting to make the actual appointments. Right. Because the re the resolution includes the appointments. Mm -hmm. I, I just put blanks in there. Yeah, got it. Got it. Theo. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I obviously support this. Uh, um, I just want to add a couple wrinkles. One is that the zoning bylaws that we're working on, and we're coming very close to it, and Madam Chair might want to speak to that. Um, the edits that we're proposing does this conflation. Uh, and, and, and as a result, if it, meaning the two bodies are, are taken out and, and, the, and the, 
review is now under the proposed zoning bylaws that you're about to see will be done by the DRB. And so if the DRB in July, they might be looking at for guidance in kind of a transitional zoning bylaw document that's not yet been fully adopted. I don't, I don't think that's too big a hurdle that there's no change to the standards or anything like that. It's, it's really just that aspect. And the other thing that I'll throw in there that I, that I think is a possible consideration for you, if not in this resolution, is to what extent a select board member or members would be interested in also participating um, on a rotating basis or not. I just think our, our thinking is the continuity between kind of, it's almost like all three branches in one, really. It's kind of, you are the executive branch, but you also have this power to promulgate these zoning bylaws and and then you might sit in judgment of of certain decisions in a quasi judicial way so we like the idea of the as sandy presented of, of having a select uh, planning commission uh, person be present uh, for that insight and assistance and perhaps even a select board member so we just wanted to throw that out there um, i don't think it's necessary but um select you end up living with the body's decisions, so perhaps it's helpful to have a rudder or a member um, on on that DRB as well. And those are my only two additional comments. And just a quick question on that, Theo. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Phil. Um, you might be. Uh, uh, we're going to ask the same thing I am, but Theo, do you, you don't see any conflict of interest? That's exactly select, what I can ask. <laughs> select board member were to serve on the DRB, and the and um, there was an appeal of a DRB decision, I'm assuming, would go to the select board for a hearing and a ruling. Um, concerns about that? I think an appeal of a DRB would go to environmental court, but then the select board would oh. need to make some decisions about defending that and hiring counsel and so on. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, it's a really excellent question. Uh, sorry, Mitch, go ahead. No, you're fine. Um, no, I, I think co conflict is always something you have to evaluate. Uh, it doesn't jump out at me that, that the mere membership uh, in a decision that's written and adopted would be anything but that. Uh, okay. And uh, so uh, the, the conflicts that are might be more common is where someone has to recuse themselves because the underlying matter they have some interest or something in sure uh, and that does occasionally happen regardless of where the party that's on the drb is also uh, in our in our uh, town government right okay so uh with that said and that was exactly my question phil you must have been sending i was either <laughs> sending the vibrations to you or you were sending them to me um, and, and mitch seems to have something i'm sorry because he's also on our planning commission so. oh, okay go ahead Mitch. that's fine uh two Real quick comments. One, I suspect that the state statute might speak to whether there are any conflicts with some members being on different bodies. We could probably check that out very easily. Um, one thing that you did mention when you talked about an appeal, and again, I'm no expert, but I believe there is a provision that if if a applicant appeals a decision to the state environmental court, I believe it is possible for either the select board or the probably more likely the town attorney to negotiate a settlement while that appeal is pending. So that might be a reason why the select board might want to stay out of things. And one final question, I apologize if I showed up too late and missed that this is already discussed, but we may want to check with the zoning administrator and make sure that there's not a matter warned for the ZBA during the period that we're transitioning, if we're going to, you know, if they warn something that's going to go to the ZBA, would hate to find out that the ZBA went away and now that has to be redone to go to the DRB. But very minor. You guys probably thought of that already. That's all I have. Well, that's, probably, that's probably the reason to delay it to July 1st. That means it would be less likely that that would happen. Yes, we, don't have any, we don't have anything scheduled beyond May right now. I think yeah, Mitch is right great. To, sorry, I just throw in that it's a great discussion, Mitch. And I think to the extent a select board member were part of the decision body, that party might not participate in the negotiation for settlement 
Uh, I mean, that might be a way to manage it. I, I just, I don't know why I've had this floating around for so long. We saw this kind of effect of folks that aren't connected to the actual adoption of the bylaws in decision-making seats without the kind of in, input and knowledge that the actual promulgators have. So I, that's the only reason for it. Um, for some reason, I'm saying things a little bit longer than I would like, but that's the underlying point. Uh, Dorinda, you want to comment? Um, I'm assuming this is going to have no impact on the budget. It would we would just anything. I mean, there'll be fees associated with hearings and all. I'm assuming we would just um, flop any money we have associated to the zoning board of adjustment into a DRB account now or something like that. Yeah, I would think so. I would think so, yes. If there's any question about that, I mean, I'm sure we could get some guidance from the League of Cities and Towns. There are a number of towns that have gone through this, so we're not recreating the we're not recreating the wheel, I don't think. So the only other the only other question I have is uh, Theo, you mentioned potentially uh, having a rotating member of the select board serve that to me seems like a bad idea just because of continuity so what i'd like to do is let's let the select board think about this a little bit and also see if there's someone interested in serving but i think we can i think we can go ahead in the meantime and uh and adopt sandy's resolution and start the process assuming no one has any other uh no one has any other questions or concerns <laughs> Just, just, and thank you for that. And, and the select board membership rotating or not is not a deal breaker. I just wanted to add it to the discussion. Right. Thank you. Peter. Yes. I haven't read that resolution and, and Sandy had mentioned uh, initially that we, that she would might get some names because she's got blanks in there instead of names. So if she gets some names and we do some talking, we could, uh, adopt this resolution next meeting instead of tonight. And then we could probably- it probably, it probably doesn't make sense to adopt it with blanks in there. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah. Would, would you like me to, I mean, I can certainly survey the planning commission we're meeting tomorrow night and see if there's volunteers who are interested in serving. And then I would also reach out to the zone, to the state, existing zoning board of adjustment and see if there's interest from them. Um, and assuming those slots can be filled with them, does that, I will, I would forward those on to the select board. If people are saying they don't want to serve, there would have to be some way to solicit other interest. Correct. Does that work? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. I like that. So, so just to be clear, and I think I've, I think I've got this, but I want to be sure we all understand. So what, what actually goes away in this is the zoning board of adjustment goes away. The planning commission continues to exist, and we have a de development review board, really in lieu of the uh, zoning board of adjustment. And, and I mean, the planning commission currently does site plan review and subdivision review. Right. That would now be done by the development review board. The planning commission would no longer be involved in any permitting decisions. We would only be writing the, the regular planning commission. Planning Commission still exists and you would be doing your work, for instance, the zoning regulations and other things. Planning yeah. work, not, yes, got it. But not site okay. review. Yeah. So, right. So with that, I, I would suggest if you could do that, Sandy, that would be great. Okay. Um, hopefully they'll be willing to serve at least initially because some kind of continuity through this process, just in terms of knowledge and familiarity with how this all works, I think would be good. And then if people want to get off and we need to appoint or find more people, we'll find them. Okay. I, I will try to get that ready for your next meeting and you can have it then. And yep. it would, with the understanding, it would be effective July 1st. Assuming everybody agrees that that makes sense. That was my yep. idea that it'd be July 1st, but yep. nobody disagrees. I think that makes sense. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody on that? Okay. Uh, 
I do not see Russ Bennett. But we're a few minutes early. Do you, uh, I also included a provision for planning commission updates. I didn't know if Sandy wanted to oh, do okay. that. Off yeah, I guess why well, while you're waiting for Russ, I did send you just a, sh a short email that included both a draft of the final report for the scoping study. We'll be reviewing that and getting any additional input at our meeting tomorrow. Um, I think that's come together well, but welcome any any thoughts that you or others have. I believe the process is then we would finalize that report, the Du Bois and King would finalize that report and then it gets sent on to the select board to, um, I don't know if you need to adopt it or approve it or or what. Um, Accept it, whatever the word is. Yeah. Whatever that would be. And then the other piece is the, the zoning regulations update. We are, we have a, a, a final draft. There's still a number of typos and some formatting and so on, but I think the substance is pretty much all there. We'll be reviewing that tomorrow. So Maybe a few additional changes, but we're hoping to get it ready and um, for a public uh, planning commission public hearing in June. Um, and then it would be forwarded to the select board in July and you would need to have a hearing and also that it could be voted on in November. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Yes, Steve. Question for Sandy, and I think that uh, Theo mentioned this, but what about the changes if we're adopting the Development Review Board? Um, well, that was one of the reasons I wanted to get a sense from the select board earlier if this was some, something you wanted to do because the draft of the, the zoning update ha has a development review board. We wrote it as if there would be a development review board in place. Okay. Um, since it would be effective in July and it's not gonna be voted on until November, I think it's fine to, to have it that way and it would have that continuity and you could actually see how it would operate with a development review board then. Perfect. Okay. Almost sounds like we're organized. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy, for for uh, and Theo for for leading this. Um, I think it is going to be a good change, and it's going to simplify our process, which I like a lot. Make it easier and simpler. Um, we still don't have Russ. Um, We probably got 10 minutes. Uh, should we consider the road foreman's request for clarification on bonuses provided to town employees action possible? Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So I think where we were when we last discussed this was the sense of the conversation was that those bonuses that were given were hiring bonuses and they were given because of exigent circumstances, as they, as they say. And as such, uh, Shane was already on board and didn't participate in that. And that uh, effective July 1st, his wife will be covered uh, on the health insurance per what, we've, per what we've approved. But I don't know if that's how do, how do the other board members feel about that? Is that where we are? Is that what we want to say? Yep. That was my recollection. Uh, so I guess the question is, do we want to, do we want to make a motion on that or do we just want to include it in the minutes? What just, say you, uh, Randy, on this? I don't, I don't feel like we need to make a motion and vote on it. It feels like a no. clarification issue. It's, we can just include it in the minutes and, and that it's going to be effective July one. And, and I think that the meeting minutes from before, you know, kind of back this all up. So it's just clarification. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that unless anybody disagrees. Yes, Sarah. I just want to say that Russ has arrived. Oh, okay. Perfect timing. Just let you have a seat. It's going to be right here. Okay. Everybody. Oh my goodness! In person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I realized I wasn't going to have time to get to someplace else, and I was driving by. <laughs> Perfect. Well, you're always welcome, Russ. Thank you. 
Um, oh, so you're on. I know we're I know we're a little bit early, but believe it or not, we're ahead of schedule, and you're a little early, so it's all good. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I want to just sort of update you as to what our thinking is, or a little bit as we sort of learn it. So um, we, I think we met, I mentioned before, Stone Environmental when they did the studies for you, they identified some fracture trace analysis where they thought there might be chances of finding water up there on the Kobe property. And then we had a analysis done called sort of low frequency vibration where they send a, a low, low, low frequency through the ground um, from three different locations. And that helps to identify where they think there's gonna be fissures in the ledge, in the bedrock, and you might get water. So we did that in one of the fracture trace areas and we drilled two wells um, and they're deepish. Uh, we hit water a couple places on the way down, but they're both, they each generate well drillers yield about 50 gallons a minute. And it, so that's a lot of water, <laughs> uh, it's a hundred gallons a minute. But I think by the time we go through permitting and um replenishment you know testing all that kind of stuff it'll probably net around 50 something like that um and i just thought i would keep you informed as to what we're doing you know, we're going to want to do um you know i don't know how many housing units initially you know maybe six or 12 or something like that mostly probably multifamily to begin with um and a daycare and a few things like that in the very first beginning of what this, this thing could be. Um, oh, and just as a sort of general note, we're not planning on selling any land. We're gonna make it all held together by a condominium kind of structure so that the values you know, run, with the, run with the thing. Um, so anyway, we're gonna have to do a fair amount of pretty heavy water testing and permitting and all that engineering to put the put a water system in place and so it seemed to me like we're headed on a good path and this might be a good time to be thinking about it'll take years of course um if you wanted to if we wanted to have a conversation about whether you want to be a part of that or do we want to create a water district or a fire district or something that, like that because there'll be enough, we're enough upgrading that uh, you, know, you could provide hydrant system and water, general water to Middlesex Village um, if that made sense to you. Um, you would, would find yourself with you know, a willing partner, shall we say. Um, if you guys can take if you want to think there. about it, the computer over there. So I think the answer is we'd have to think about it. Um, for me, I'm saying we're we're interested. I mean, in terms of the uh, long term development of the village and that area, having real water uh, and also having hydrants would be a would be a big thing. I mean, we'd have to figure out the the downfall of our first uh effort to do this when we were talking about trying to do it do it on our own was that the sense of the folks in the village was that they did not want to and i forget what the amount of money was now that hypothetically they were going to have to pay on an annual basis to have water mm -hmm. um, but they didn't want to do it now that was that was a long time ago uh and the world could have totally changed but I think we would be foolish if we didn't at least explore it. So presumably what, what you would have is some kind of some kind of reservoir tank, probably an underground tank up on the hillside somewhere. Yeah. Bring up the volume and then it would flow downhill by gravity, something like that. Yeah, that's the general idea where the property itself is already a few hundred feet above the village to begin with. And we'd probably send it up another hundred feet or so, you know. And that would be where it would make sense if, if this was something that we wanted to think about, we'd probably need to identify how much storage we would need for whatever the service area would be. And so that would be where 
because we're already going to be doing some percentage of this, that, that would almost be like your match in a way for, because we, we would give that to you basically as, as a beginning. You would save you a lot of money. You wouldn't have to do all the research because we would have discovered it already, if you follow what I'm saying. Um, and uh, I talked a little bit with um, Julie Beth Hines, who works with us some, and you know she was successful in, in Waitsfield in getting both sewer and water money for the town of Waitsfield, um, and asked her just to begin thinking about what would it cost to be able to fund someone to do that work if it wasn't her, you know, so that we could think long term about. How does it, how is this something that's a net win for you and not just a, oh my gosh, we, we, we don't have the money. We don't know how to get from here to there in the short term. Um, you know, we're gonna sort of be going part of the way. So it's food for thought. Yeah, it's definitely food for thought. Other, other board members, your thoughts? <clears throat> oh, just just food for thought and and Russ you've got a lot of work to do anyway to yeah get this thing off the ground you're go you're going to be doing the water thing for your project anyway correct yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. my <laughs> thought is if we're going to be doing it for ourselves anyway and if what we don't want to do is do something and get it in place, and then it's sort of like I ran into this in another town in Tennessee where we were doing a big music festival, uh, where they had run water lines that were six inch, and then where we were, they had, what, for whatever reason, downsized it to four inch, and so we couldn't tap into it. <laughs> um, so I would hate to make that kind of mistake, you know? Yeah, here's here's my concern is is we just got to keep track of the timing because if this project is going to include the town, it's going to affect the size of the reservoir. It's going to affect a lot of things because you're going to want to have enough capacity that you can do additional development on your property. If we're going to hook up to this, meaning the town hook up to it, we want to would want to have additional capacity. I mean, who knows what the what the growth of the village might be? It's not going to be tremendous, but over time, over time, there could be additional uh, things going on in the in the village, and we want to make sure that there was potential water capacity to do that. That's correct, and that's why uh, that's why I'm saying with the, the two wells that we drilled, pretty good producers. It's probably likely that using these kinds of technologies. If it wasn't enough, we would either increase the size of storage to compensate for that, which is the normal way of doing it, um, and or drill another well, which would then increase your isolation distance from you know, each other and other things. So I just am putting it out here so that we all can make really good decisions for the future um, and we don't put a limit in the way that would be impossible to undo and regrettable. I also know, uh, assuming, assuming if we did this, we would want to have hydrants, which would be yeah. uh, important, and also the potential for uh, buildings to have sprinkler systems. You know, totally. All kinds of rules about how much capacity you have to have to have, uh, to have hydrants and sprinkler systems. So we'd have to look into that as well. Yeah, and I, I, I completely agree. And I think that's one of the reasons why longer term from a sort of growth, controlled growth standpoint and economic development standpoint, if you had that kind of capacity, you would be able to say, OK, we could do this. And that would attract um, some you know, buildings that do, do or should be sprinklered. Um, because it's really expensive to sprinkle them. But once the sort of nut, the nut is uh, amortized, then it's just the cost of the water, you know, on a daily basis or whatever that would be. And, right. and that's, that becomes pretty minimal because it would be borne by the users, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, I, I guess uh, what I would say, and I, I haven't heard much from anybody else, but I mean, we're, we're intrigued by this idea. So keep us okay. in the loop and let us know what we need to do and when we need to do it. And we'll be, uh, 
we'll be in the standby mode. And at the same time, uh, we'll start poking around to see uh, with all, I mean, <laughs> the federal the federal tap appears to be closing on some of these issues. It's not going to be right. like last year, but but man, oh man, there's there's still money from what I know out there for water and sewer projects. So if right. all of a sudden there was a there was a bundle of money that would uh, that would sweeten up the pot as well. So yeah, so that's part of why I'm sort of saying it because yeah, it's not going to this moment won't last forever. And if there is desire, it might be good to get ourselves get yourselves in the queue. Yeah, you know. You can always decide not to do something, but if you don't take an action, it's a preemptive um, n nowhere, you know. Right. And some of these things, on, on, you know, the permitting, the permitting of, a, of a public water supply is not an easy process. It's going to take a while. Yeah, so we're going to bear that anyway. Yeah, but I'm, but I'm just saying it isn't like yeah. all this is happening tomorrow. We're talking about, as you said, yeah. years probably. Yeah, it'll take a year anyway to do it. When we we just have been working on a um, converting small dog uh, into a daycare for over a hundred, and so we we spent a year going through the um, upgrading of the water system, all that kind of stuff, proving it, um, la da 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 da, um, getting it to meet all the regs. Um, so we're a little bit familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 Well, thank you very much. We're yeah, excited. well, that's it. We, we want to continue being, you know, good neighbors. So I'm, I'm concerned to know if you're entering the Beardy Contest, Russ. The what contest? The Beardy Contest, which is Bearded? about to start. Yes. I didn't know there was such a thing. No, I, um, I, I might, I, I'll have to get some extensions. I think it's, I think it's an, I think it's an opportunity for you. There's so many opportunities. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Russ. We All look right. forward to working with you. Yep. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. See you bye next bye. time. I mean, who knows? Who knows where that all goes? But that would be uh, that would be an opportunity which we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't lightly let go by. That's for darn sure. Okay. Uh, joint meeting with the Middlesex Volunteer Fire Department. Welcome. Here, uh, Eric is here. I'm here. Hi, Eric. Hey, how's it going? Hey. Beautiful rainy day in Middlesex. The plants are growing like crazy. Leaves are out like crazy. And maybe the brush fires will stop now. That, that would be a good thing. Of rain, which would be a good thing. That's a definitely a good thing. Um, so I've got a, a update, monthly update for you. Since Jeff is not here, you get to listen to me spew it out. Uh, we're up to a total of 26 calls so far this year. Uh, we've had over seven, we've, yeah, over seven the last month, uh, three mutual aid outs and one mutual aid in, uh, max of members responding is seven minimum is one. Uh, tanker mutual aid call out only requires a maximum of two. And then our average members responding is 3.6. Um, let's see, engine one has been out three times, zero times for engine six, tanker one's three times and rescue one three times. Uh, so far the calls are a vehicle rollover on the interstate. We had uh, five responders there. Uh, let's see. That was on the 21st of April. The 25th of April, we had a mutual call out to Worcester for a brush fire. Uh, May 1st, we had a mutual call out to Berlin for a structure fire. Uh, May 1st, we also had a Bulldog, we had a fire alarm activation on Bulldog Road. Uh, May 2nd, we had a mutual aid out for Montpelier Route 12 for Bulldog for a car versus telephone pole. And we had a mutual aid out to East Montpelier for the barn fire that was quite big. And then we had the fire up on McCulley Hill Road last week, last Thursday, which was a shed and then woodland fire too, about an acre of, of land burned. Uh, let's see. Training, we had uh, pumper operations with dry hydrants. 
uh, repairs. We've replaced the light bulb on Rescue One. Uh, we purchased a multi-gas meter using donated money. And members of the department continue to work on vaccine pop-up clinics. Let's see. We have 12 total calls reported for a fast squad, 10 medical calls, and two are were in conjunction with the fire department calls. So that's that's pretty much a overview of the last month. Sounds like you've been pretty busy. We have been. <laughs> <laughs> and how are we doing? How are we doing on membership? Any development there? Uh, haven't had any new lately. No. Okay. But uh, we're still keeping the word out. Yep. Thank you. What's what's the current size now, Eric? Uh, we have. 10, 12, something like that. It's 10. 10, yeah. Yep. It'd always be good to have a few more. I'm sure oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So um, a couple of things that I have, and I mentioned it to, uh, I mentioned it to Jeff. Okay. Uh, and I guess he's working on it, but uh, we had a meeting uh, oh, roughly two weeks ago, select board meeting, mm -hmm. talk about the use of, uh, of the ARPA funds, which the town has. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the issues that came up was the needs of the fire department. Okay. And uh, this is an opportunity potentially to um, purchase turnout gear. Uh, we know you guys need a new, uh, new or a new used, hopefully, rescue truck. Mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So I asked him to try and uh, put together at least some rough numbers about what that was going to cost. So if you could follow up with him, just so we can have that information, I'm not promising you, we, you can do what we can do all those things, but I think the, the turnout gear uh, is an easy uh, winner to get that taken care of, which would be, uh, which would be great. Sounds good. Yeah. I will check in with him on that. Okay. Okay. And it is not, it is not urgent, but Yep. You know, for us to have that that information would be uh, would be helpful. Awesome. Um, I think the other thing the other thing I have uh, is just to think about. We keep talking about this transition. Um, if we're going to do this transition, which basically and help me out, Sarah, if I've got this wrong, but I think all it requires is a is a select board vote. Um, mm -hmm. I think we would want to have uh some kind of informational meeting or uh i hate to use the word public hearing because i don't think it'd be that formal but anyway yep. i make sure we get the information out to the public and they understand what's going on before we do that and uh in my mind i've been thinking that uh we would potentially do that this fall um assuming everything's going along well and and you guys are still agreeing that this is a good good way to go forward and the select yeah. board is still agreeing it's a good way to go forward i so, think i think it's probably really the only way to go forward but that's my yeah opinion. yeah well we i, I think we all we, <laughs> i think we all agree we just gotta we just gotta uh we just gotta gotta pull the trigger on that so i guess yeah. if you guys can can see any any problems or concerns uh we need to know what they are i mean it's it's mm -hmm. uh not much is really going to happen or happen or change, except for uh, some different IRS reporting and a different way you handle your nonprofit if you decide to keep yep. to keep that uh, keep that going. Yep. Uh, yeah. and we can we can certainly pull a meeting together on our end and and discuss that so that we have feedback from everybody and and kind of bring that forward. Yeah, I just want to be sure we're. We're taking we're taking baby steps, or maybe bigger than baby steps, in the right uh, the right direction. Other yeah. other board yeah. members thought thoughts on this. Does that sound right to all of you? Yeah, sounds sounds right to me. I just did want to thank you guys for having Sarah send out uh, the report that you just did. That's nice to be able to have it in front of you. Yeah. Yes. But it, we we try to do that for sure. I think the only the only thing that pops into my head, and and I think this ties into the public meeting or whatever you want to call it that Peter was mentioning, was just making sure that the 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 town residents understand that you know um, 
this is done as a joint effort and with support from both sides. I think that's oh, extremely important. Yeah, I, I agree, Randy. That's that's the whole deal is that we're, uh, you know, we're doing this together is the best way to move forward for the town and fire protection and uh, fire protection in the town. Absolutely. And, uh, the other thing I would I would just mention quickly to you, Eric, and I don't, I don't know if you were if you were uh, listening in when uh, Russ Bennett was here. Did you hear that conversation? I, 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 I the last five, 10, 10 minutes or so of it. Yep. OK. Um, there is the potential they have found on the on the Colby farm uh, a lot of water capacity mm -hmm. potentially, mm -hmm. and he is willing to discuss a system where uh, the town would be able to tie into that water, mm -hmm. which would mean potentially we could have hydrants in the village, mm -hmm. we could have sprinkler systems in new buildings or even retrofitted in old buildings. And the residents could have plenty of plenty of uh, pure clean water, which would be great. That's that's yep. that's definitely off in the future. That's not happening tomorrow, but it's an exciting well, it's exciting thing to think about. It's uh, yeah, yeah. That's actually very exciting. Absolutely. Hydrants would make a huge uh, <laughs> a huge difference. <laughs> yes, yes. In the they and also just in terms of of ability to to fill tankers and get out into the countryside. If you can tie into a hydrant, that's uh, that's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. So anyway, just to just so you guys know that that's going on and we'll certainly keep you in the loop as that goes forward. Sounds good. Um, anything else, board members? Well, the good so, work. Thank so you. I'm thinking and I'm just I'm just thinking, but Having having public meetings in the summer is is tough getting yeah, people together. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking maybe we would point towards having whatever our public process is going to be having it sometime in September. Mm -hmm. Does that makes sense. It, if that works, yeah, I'm good with it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Be safe. Thanks, sir. Yes. Enjoy your evening. Okay. We will. And Eric. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Highway department update, action possible. Sarah, did you have something? No, I was just complimenting Eric. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> nice. <thing. laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Thank it's you, nice Eric. To actually meet in person, you know? I know. It's nice. Boy, I'll tell you, though, you know, things are not good in Washington County right now. I don't... <laughs> I don't think the time to really meet in person is here yet, but anyway. So um, highway department update, Victor. Um, yeah, um, a few things go on in the last couple of weeks. Um, we did want to discuss um, if we can use some ARPA funds for doing some of the prep work for the center road paving project, such as the culvert crossings. And we've, I've reached out to uh, a couple people and uh, waiting to get some idea of what it would cost. Um, just to do culverts, uh, Shane uh, thinks he's, we still want to uh, do the ditching and uh, uh, berm removal. Um, so didn't, also, we, didn't we have a number, a, a provisional number at least, Victor, last year about what we thought those culverts would cost? Are we, are we don't. <clears throat> We have the culverts. We have the culverts. Uh, I'm talking about digging the uh, and and replacing the ones that uh, we have to replace. No, no, no. I under I understand that, yes. but but we had when we were going over last fall, and I don't have those numbers in front of me. Uh, what the potential cost of that project was? I think we had a number, at least a guesstimate number for what that would be. I do not recall that. No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, then I would say the first the first step in the process is to try and 
to try and get a number. I mean, we're going to be, <laughs> you know, I think we came up with, I, can, I think we came up with a laundry list uh, the way exceeded our ARPA funds uh, when we were having our, uh, our general discussion. But certainly that's a potentially, potentially good use of the money. We just got to, got to weigh it with the other things we're trying to look at. So to get us a, to get us a number to plug into our grid so we can be thinking about it would be good. Right. Okay. That's why, you know, I mean, that number would come from somebody from the people that we check with that, uh, uh, we're checking with that uh, would give us a price for, you know, a potential price for doing that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure the way things are in uh, uh, right now, uh, who knows what the price would, uh, would be with, you know, $6 a gallon fuel and, and all that. Uh, so well, it's certainly going to be more, more than what we thought it was a year ago. That's for darn sure. But I just want to make sure that we have, before we before we start down the road of actually do, doing that project, we know what the costs are and where the money's going to come from. We know we've got the paving grant, uh, but the other work that we're going to have to do to accomplish this, we need to figure figure out what right. the cost is going to be. And, and in addition, we got the grant for Shady Rill paving project also. We did. Yeah. Now well, that's good news. I had not heard that. It's. Uh, but there is one thing is there an environmental study that or environmental uh, requirements uh, that have to be met, but I'm not quite sure what those are yet. So we would like we would likely do that next year, correct? Not this year. That's correct. Yeah. We're gonna have <laughs> we're gonna have enough to do with the center road project and everything else we've got uh, we've got going on. Yeah. I mean, we almost have to hire somebody to uh, to help out on that because we we don't have the equipment and we don't have probably the manpower to do it. Right. Well, they're too deep, right, for our excavator. Yeah. Even if they're not, I mean, uh, they certainly we don't have trench boxes and right. We don't have uh, we don't have uh, per se some way to. Uh, for traffic control of, right. of whatever sort you want to do. Right. Well, whatever we're going to do, we're talking about, we're talking about the paving project going on in August and September, right? That's potentially uh, what uh, Hutchins uh, indicated as, uh, as you heard last uh, select board meeting that they wanted to do it when they do route two in uh, Middlesex state, Iowa. They just want to keep going. Well, from what I hear about getting contractors to do anything, whether it's panning a few nails or digging a ditch, we better we better get on this and get somebody lined up to do it if we're going to go ahead with this project. Okay. Like I said, I got one definite interested and one maybe. Okay. So, okay. That's the best I could do this week. No, I hear you. Victor, and, uh, do you know the amount of the award that was given for the Shady Rail project? Not off the top of my head. But it should be, uh, I think it's in your, should be in your email. I think I got an email. I must have missed it. I didn't, I didn't see it. Okay. No, I didn't see one. We can get that to you. Okay. Well, it'd just, be nice, it'd just be nice to know. Now, is there, there's a match associated with that also, right? Yeah. I'll get you that information. We'll send it out to you. Okay. Email it to you. Okay. Thank you. I would say I would say it should be likely that we would do that after July first, a year from this July first, because there's nothing in next year's budget for this. That's for sure. Correct. I, I think we're going to have I, I think we're going to have all we can all we can chew on to get the center road project completed. So, yeah. Regarding the uh, the note the email that I sent, I guess I just sent it to uh, Vic, and I think I sent it to you, Peter, to the treasurer, and to Shane. But uh, it's just a note saying you your application has been granted. This project may require an, an to undergo an environmental review. But the, there was no documentation. There's no saying exactly how much the grant was for. Okay. Okay. That's why I didn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So moving right along here. Um, um, 
you know, we're having issues with our uh, with our uh, chloride truck. Pretty serious. It's a 1984. Um, we, uh, you know, we can't we can't really grade too much more if we don't have a good um, chloride tr uh, truck. And it quit on us. I think it was last Tuesday. Yeah, last Tuesday. And uh, we did get it running Thursday morning. Uh, it was a matter of uh, getting fuel uh, to uh, to start it with. Uh, it was only a matter of uh, um, bleeding the system, but uh, it took a while to get there. Um, well, then after we got it going, they pulled it over to the, we got chloride last Thursday, filled that whole tank, uh, or 4,500 gallons. And, um, then they discovered a hole in the oil pan on the truck. So we, we had to stop that. We have one coming out of Texas and, uh, we're all the crew today, uh, Charles, uh, and, uh, worked on uh, getting that ready as soon as it comes in. Uh, I guess they can put it in. Uh, they were having a little difficulty removing it, but hopefully we'll be able to get that going relatively soon. Um, like I said, the truck is pretty old. Uh, my ears picked up when uh, Eric said something about they wanted to trade one of their trucks in with an emergency truck. I don't know, just a minute ago, but yep. anyways. And, uh, of course, we don't have any money, but the, the issue with uh, putting it in the back of the freight liner is that the hydro cedar is in the back. And there's been some thought of getting a small trailer, but we don't have any money. So I don't know how, how, how about how we go about that. So that you would have a trailer with all the tanks on it and, and, the pump and, and storage for the hydro mixture. Problem, you know, the, the the problem with that that old fire truck is, yes, it's old, doesn't have very many miles on it, but it gets used so intermittently. You know, if we if we fired that thing up and ran it every week, it'd probably be fine. But when it sits for months and months and months at a time, and then you go to use it just like anything else, it's not going to work. The brakes aren't going to work right. That, you know, the fuel system's going to need bleeding all that. So. Well, that was that was pretty much due to a uh, a solenoid, yeah. That, and we had it. We had we put the old one back in, and it and it it happened. They had one. They replaced it, and they put it back in. Anyways, it fired up. But the but the but the truck. I mean, if you take a look at it, it's it doesn't pass inspection uh, at all. And uh, the hood, if you take the the. The electrical cord that goes to the headlights is what holds the hood from falling on the ground. Well, that sounds like a good safety feature. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty corroded in the back around the springs and, and uh, in the frame in the back. I mean, it's old. Uh, no Victor, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I actually, I actually like the idea of, uh, of uh, finding a, finding a trailer. Uh, okay. but you know there's there's no money left in this year's budget but right look around, look around and see what you can find oh there's a nice one in the auction last weekend but he went to the auction Du boys auction what we're talking about they had one with a it went for it relatively cheap too well let's keep our kind of squinting your eyes like I, I mean we need you know, hearkening back to Victor and I had a discussion last week of, you know, we go from we go from slimy mud to dust within about two days and then the phone starts to ring. My phone was certainly ringing and, uh, you know, people aren't wrong. We, we had to put down we had to put down a bunch of that expensive fine snow because of the stone, not snow, stone because of the mud. And then it dries right up and then we have billowing clouds of, uh, of dust and our residents are ripping mad about the dust and we weren't able to we weren't able to do anything with uh, chloride because we weren't uh, we weren't up and running yet with the chloride. I mean, we need to the, the days. The, what I'm saying is, I think the days are gone when we can have some kind of a half baked solution to our uh, 
sure. fluoride. Yeah, we we actually did, Peter. We actually went over there and greeted that, and we actually on uh, uh, whatever day it was, uh, Tuesday. Yep. Monday was the explosion. Monday evening was the explosion, and Tuesday I went over early in the morning and I said we got to go do that yep. section. We graded it. And uh, they did have some chloride on that truck and they put it on there and we kept going down uh, Center Road, but then they they had, they, the truck broke down over on Culver Hill. We had to have it towed. So we spent like a thousand, over a thousand bucks on that truck in the last week. Yeah, that's not a good. Not, not a, a good scenario. Well, good money after bad, because it isn't like it's really fixed that truck. That's right. So, anyways. Um, yeah, I guess that's it's. Um, I guess we you got that email last night. I don't know if you want to talk about that now about from Iona Kemp. Before, yeah, before I love you move on from yeah, the, the go grade, ahead, uh, Randy. Before you move on from the grading conversation, is is the reason that we weren't out all this last week grading um, because of the breakdown of the chloride truck. Um. It was partially, but yeah, well, and then we had, we didn't, uh, the crew went to uh, the uh, state uh, meeting up at, or uh, event up at uh, the uh, Barry Auditorium for all state and municipal people that wanted to go. It's uh, a uh, place where a lot of vendors show up and you find out, you know, you can see new stuff coming out that you can buy and you can talk to people that are in the same business as you are or same line of work. So that, that day we didn't grade because uh, uh, they went to that. And then. Uh, so let me just interrupt you a second. So yeah. I know it has been our practice over the years to have the entire road crew go to those meetings. Yeah. And I just wonder if that's the best use of our resources. I mean, we gave up, we gave up three people for a whole day uh, for them to go up there. And I'm going to be careful how I say this, but basically have a party with their buddies up there. Now, if they were looking to find somebody to hire, that might have been an opportunity for that, I guess. But I mean, I think it makes sense for for you to go to that, Victor, if you want to go, and maybe the road foreman go, but I don't think we need to send the whole road crew to that in the future. But that's just my uh, that's just my feeling. And I know they like I know they like going, but like you said, Randy, we had a four day week. That was one of our four days. Yes, Dorinda. Clarify the guys. Only two of the people went, and they went in the morning, and then took the afternoon off. Well. We lost, we lost one of our four days for road construction and repair activity. Let's put it that way. And I, if they're entitled to the time off, they're entitled to the time off. But it's just something to think about going forward, how we want to. Uh... Uh, on the same token, Peter, I mean, they, uh, we worked on the truck Thursday morning, the chloride truck, and then the oil thing went, and then everybody went home in the afternoon. You know, all, all I'm saying, guys, is, there we had, and I think Randy would agree with me, we had four beautiful, sunny, warm, dry days, and we had a pretty unproductive week because of the issues that Victor has had to describe to us. So that isn't what we want to be doing. I don't think that should be our, our goal. We, we get it, and I mean, now we're, now we're back, in the, uh, back in monsoon season again. But didn't you speak, didn't you say, are you still thinking about that of having a discussion? With the road crew? Yeah, or and, road foreman. Yes, I mean, I'm, I am. Uh, about, uh, about what? A discussion about what? So what I'm concerned about is, and I talked to, and I talked to Victor about it, is it doesn't seem to me, and I'm not down there every day, I'm not talking to the guys, but it just set me off last week that, you know, very little was it. now I understand stuff was going on behind the scenes, but in terms of productive work for improving and maintaining the roads, there wasn't a lot going on. And that I, I, that, I have the same feelings, Peter. I, that, I agree that, with you. That's discouraging to me. And uh, I just want to make sure that 
uh, and I want to be careful how I say this, but I want Shane to take control of that road crew, and I want us to be able to hold his feet to the fire about decisions that are being made about what, I mean, I would have, I would have sent him out and had him cut brush if they didn't have anything else to do. I don't know. So, so, I mean, if the issues, if the issue is that they, they want the afternoons off, I mean, maybe the conversation is let's go to a five day work week um, and don't work the 10 hour, 10 hour days. And, and if, if that's really what you want, if you want to get done it, you know, 3.30 or 3 o'clock or whatever, maybe that's the conversation to be had. I mean, I think personally, I I think that opens up a lot of flexibility dealing with weather and all kinds of stuff like that, especially through the summertime. Um, you know, and I know that's probably a hot topic conversation with those guys. Um, but if they, if, if three days out of the last week, they left early every single day, um, maybe Maybe that's a conversation worth having. Well, that's that's my point. So, what I was what I was thinking of, and and we never we never finalized it because I wanted to, you know, talk about it tonight. But whether it's whether it's Victor sitting down with Shane or or myself and Victor sitting down, I don't I don't know I don't know how we go forward with this, or we can we can discuss it in a in a select board meeting. But you know, I just get the feeling that there's a lot of hanging around at the shop when they could be doing meaningful work. And I don't know that that's the case. I'm not there, but it sounds like it's a case. So. Hey, I think Peter, that if you're going to do that, I think you should have two select board members. I, I think that they should, I think that Shane should come to a meeting and have it on the agenda and do it, do it as a, as a board. I actually like that. I actually like that better. Yep. Yeah. And I want I want him to know. I, I I want to be very careful how I say this. But I have a I have a feeling that Shane tends to operate on a consensus model of management. Shall we say? I mean, he's used to being a member of the road crew and not being in charge of the road crew. And there's a difference. And I just want him to know that I expect him to be the leader of the road crew and not, not have them tell him what they want to do, but have him tell them what they should be doing and make sure, make damn sure they do it. I agree with um, that. And, and making sure that he understands that if, if there's not follow through on their end, that the select board's here to support, support him and back him in that. So, absolutely. you know, that's, I think that's absolutely right. I agree with you. So let's, let's put Shane on the, on the agenda for our next board meeting, Sarah, please. And Vic, if you would let him know also, that would be great. Let him tomorrow, let him know tomorrow morning. And just, you know, just let him know what our, what our, what our general concerns are. I don't, I don't want to cause a big, a big hoorah about this, but you know, this all harkens back to, does this four day work schedule really work? And uh, I'm coming around to thinking more and more than it isn't working, but I don't I don't know if the four day work week is, part of the problem or part of the part of the solution we're stuck with it for this year but uh we just need to get and, and the other thing we need to do which i don't know what more we can do but we're we're getting nowhere in terms of hiring our new uh road crew members so uh i don't know what more we can do to get the word out but we need to we need to do it and we need to try and find somebody i guess we've got we've got nothing victor from our uh potential bonus for our existing employees, right? Correct. The only thing that might be impossible in the wind is some people that might want to work. And I don't know how that will work out. I've discussed it with Shane. He's interested uh, hiring somebody with uh, on a part-time basis, like for the summer. And see yeah. if that'll work. I, I mean, as, until, a, as, a until we, aid, as a band aid, you know, maybe yes, as a band aid, as a band aid, correct. But no. we need we need four people on the road crew. I mean, if we have a if we have a snowstorm and one one or two members of the road crew are sick, we're in we're in trouble. We don't have enough people to get in the trucks and and do what needs to be done. And having made the step to go to a four person road crew for all those reasons, I'm I'm interested in having a four person full time road crew. But 
you know, whatever we have to do in the meantime to make sure we get the work done, we should do. But I don't know whether we start, I mean, some of the towns are, are, uh, are offering a higher on bonus now. So maybe we should, uh, in, in addition to our, our, uh, our little kicker for, for employees who bring us a viable candidate who gets hired, maybe we should start advertising the higher on bonus. I don't know, but I do not want to go into next winter with a three-person road crew if we can possibly avoid it. I, and winter's coming. It felt to me like it was coming this morning. Yeah. So I think we're all on the same page, Peter. Yeah. So, Sarah? Sarah, Sarah, Sarah? Yes, I'm here. So we've, we've still got our position uh, listed on that uh, website, right? Yep, we've no, everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, and no and action. No action. So- I've called other towns too and asked them for their rejects. <laughs> and there are no rejects. They hire the rejects. <laughs> Maybe we should contact the corrections department. Maybe we should hire a few of them. You know, that's not a bad idea. They work cheap. <laughs> and they can make the signs. I think, I, think huh? Victor, I think Victor and Shane would look good with, uh, with 12 gauge shotguns, and port arms and sirens. No, no. Anyway, no, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm just being facetious about that. I mean, what, what do you think board members about uh, offering? Uh, I don't know that it'll make any difference, but we got to do something. Well, isn't the issue, Peter, really, isn't the issue, excuse me, isn't it really the issue that people have been told for years to go to college and get a degree, you'll get a better job, and the trades have kind of gone behind? Isn't that what the present legis legislature is finding out? It's just There's just not people out there that can do that kind of work that uh, want to work for a town. Right. That's certainly part of the problem, I agree. But I have to believe at some amount of money or under some circumstances, uh, we would be able to hire somebody. I mean, I would be willing to hire an interested young candidate who wants to get trained. Maybe, I mean, to think that we're gonna get somebody who can operate heavy equipment, drive a plow truck, do all the things that we want a road crew member to do, clearly we're not succeeding at that. So. You know, if we have if we have somebody who's basically a gopher for a couple of months and can learn to can learn to drive the the pickup and you know start slowly being able to do productive work, maybe that's the approach we have to take. And there are a lot of kids. There are a lot of kids graduating from high school. They've got to be looking for work, and they're not all going to college. I can tell you that. I don't know. I'm I'm just I'm just throwing out ideas. Yes, Dorinda. Have we tried contacting these driving schools where they get their CDLs that they put something out to their students? Good idea. There's, you know, like we have one right in Barry, and right. you know that would be um, that if you got ahead of the graduating group or whatever that. Yeah, I, th I think we have to do everything we can do, but I think. I think A, considering a, a sign-on bonus and B, considering, you know, not saying that a CDL was an initial requirement. Well, I mean, we'll hire them, we'll send them to the school and have them get their CDL. I don't know. Wow. I think it's the marijuana laws. I think now that it's legal and all over the place, you can't, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you can't no one wants a CDL because you can't, you, you can't, won't work. They don't pass the test. It will pass the test. <laughs> well, that'll be the that'll be the next thing they change. Oh no! Right. <laughs> but I don't think we're looking. I don't. You know, that's a good idea, Dorinda. Everything, everybody's good ideas, but we're not looking for a truck driver. We got we got truck drivers enough. We're looking for somebody that can run the excavator, can run the grader, can run the wheel loader backhoe. Um. But all I'm, all I'm saying, Victor, is whether, whether it's a truck driver or an equipment operator, maybe we got to hire somebody and send them to school and train them. That's all I'm, that's all I'm saying, rather than expect to find somebody with experience who's going to immediately go to work. Well, I think you got to find somebody with natural talent first. 
Well, the heavy equipment is really only used during the summer months, right? And it's more just plowing and, um, you know, grading or whatever in the winter. Is that true or no? No, I mean, you're right. It's snow plowing and sanding in the wintertime, but I mean, we still have to maintain the roads. I mean, there's a lot more than just running the grader down the road and and we have to do, you know, somebody that we have to have somebody that's really good on uh, ditching and putting stone in and, uh, uh, you know, fixing ero uh, places that are eroded. Uh, uh, you know, not all the time can we use an excavator. Sometimes we have to use that. Uh, it's more practical to use the wheel loader backhoe. Uh, all, I'm, all I'm saying, Victor, is if we can't find somebody with experience, you hire somebody without experience and you train them. That's all I'm saying. And you know, you start them out, maybe, I don't know what the easiest thing to operate is. You start them out on the, on the loader in the sand pit where hopefully they can't get in too much trouble. Work up to the excavator and the grader. I, I don't know, send them to school, their schools. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good job and a good opportunity for the right person. It's just discouraging to me that we can't find that person. You're absolutely right, Peter. It's a good job. We pay well. It's good. Everything. Good benefits. Good benefits. Everything. So how do we, if we wanted to even explore that, I like your idea of contacting the driving school, Dorinda. That's a, that's a good one. Um, how would we reach out? So kids that are getting, getting graduating from high school right now as we speak, where are they going to look for work? Creamy stand. <laughs> Bar room, I know. But I'm but I'm just saying, I think we need to I think we need to put the word out and we've got to we've got to carefully craft what we say, but we're looking somebody for somebody to be a trainee member of the road crew. And employee, employment and training. Yeah, it I would think so. specific that we we're willing to train. Yes, Sarah. I have contacted employment and training about this. I did not say they're willing to train, but they, they are those those are con I've had those conversations with those guys. Okay. Yeah, but I think the I think changing the pitch of our ad saying, you know, we're willing to train somebody, the CDL is not a requirement. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's a maybe it's a crazy idea, but somehow. Somehow, I mean, it wouldn't take it wouldn't take that much to get the right person hired and have them driving the pickup next winter. You don't need a CDL to drive the pickup, right? No. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And whenever a school comes up for a backhoe operator or loader operator or grader operator, we send them to the school. People got to start somewhere. Yeah. It's a lot better than it's a lot better than I mean, if, it, if it's somebody who likes equipment, maybe it's somebody who's worked on a farm and used tractors and equipment on a farm, you know, as a kid. I don't know. I, I don't I know. Think, I, I think that if you made it so the CDL was or obtaining a CDL within a period of time um, was part of the agreement coming in and they didn't have to have it on day one of employment. Um, but, you know, and I don't know what the schools are, six weeks or something like that. I think Drew's runs through their program or something like that. So you could, you, you know, within the first six months, you know, yeah. I'm sure somebody could obtain a CDL. They're, are they going to be the most experienced people? No. Um, but, you know, it, it does it does get somebody through the door. I think you just need to be careful about just filling a position to fill a position though. I mean, it, it would have to be the right candidate, somebody who's who's got some ambition behind them. And, and I just think you'd want to screen that appropriately yeah. um, or rigorously, not appropriately, but- um, Well, both. No, I can- Rigorous hire, would be appropriate. Hiring a, hiring a young kid <laughs> right out of school is, is, certainly, uh, is certainly a risk, but if we could find the right, if we could find the right person, I, I don't know. I mean, if they work, if, if we send them to school and they work for us to two years and they go on and do something else, maybe that's a win-win. I don't know. Yeah, but Peter- If we want to send them to school and have them immediately go out and take another job, we'd have to have some kind of, 
some kind and of not, you know, we'll pay I, for the school, you know, assuming I'm, you work for us for a year or whatever. I don't know. I'm not even isolating it to the young kids. I'm thinking about there are other people in the construction world that that can operate some of this machinery and whatnot that just don't have a CDL. So right. uh, removing that barrier for them and just saying, oh, you know, you're going to come in, you're going to agree to go to school to get your CDL. Um, but you come in with some experience running machinery. That's, that's huge to me. Um, and they can do a lot of the summertime stuff while they're going to school. And, and maybe it's something where you compensate them for their time to go to school to some, some manner. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't, I need, I'm not necessarily think need, just thinking about a I high think school. I think we need team. to do that. But I also think the people at employment and training could give us some guidance on this. This is what they deal with all the time. Sarah, would you would you reach out to them and explore this idea with them? Yep. I mean, I even I when our when our septic was getting pumped, I even hit up the guy at, at Kingsbury, and you know they're they're hiring like mad, mm -hmm. and they still have positions to fill, and they pay really really well. And uh, you know, if they're looking for they're looking for everybody, looking for CD CDL drivers, heavy equipment operators, laborers. They're I'm just looking at their website right now. It's it's they they talk to me about whether or not I know anybody. <laughs> no, I, I I get it. I'm just I'm just trying to figure out how to reach out to a different population. I will I will do that. I will call employment and training, and then I'll call uh, go over to uh, Vic. Is it uh, should I call? Is there any who should I call around here? Is it like it's not Barry or whatever the the vocational second? They don't teach that stuff there, do they? Or do they? No. No. No, it's um, it's up at the. Uh, it used to be up at Susanna's. Drew, Drew, Drew. Trucking. That's it. Yeah. Okay. I'll just, I'll just, when I get some time next week, I'll or this week, I'll try. I'll just call around and do the same thing that I did with the towns, which is ask for any rejects or people who, you know, just needed that training. That might help. Here's here's my latest and greatest crazy idea. I keep seeing these shows on television where women are learning how to operate heavy equipment and they have programs specifically for women. We could really stir up the rug crew by hiring a couple of ladies. Peter, you step up? so close to a lawsuit. I cannot even just stop, stop speaking. Okay. Yes. We hire women and minorities full stop period. Let's move on. Okay. Okay, just say that, that shouldn't be a radical concept. I think it's time well, for the I would tell you, I'm not saying anymore. Good. We're open to any and all reasonable, carefully vetted opportunities. How about that's, that? That's 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 right. Perfect. Okay, I think we I think we've beaten this one to death, but I think mm -hmm. we just need to we need to keep moving every way we can uh, every way we can move. Be and what do we think? Before we move on from that, Peter. I'm sorry. Yeah, Randy. Before we move on from that, just one one area that I'm still unclear on anybody's response to. I think Victor had a comment about potential part time hire over the summertime, yeah. or or whatnot. Did we? Did anybody have any feelings about that? I'm in favor of that if option. Find, if we can find a good and and you know as as I've said in the past. You know, if, if we have people, if we know of people or can find people who are interested in part-time work plowing snow, I mean, whatever, you know, whatever we can get. I mean, we got a retired person who wants to work 12 weeks in the summer and they're a heavy equipment operator. They can operate the excavator. They can operate. I mean, the, the grader is a little bit of a special, uh, a special beast, but uh, there are a lot of people around who can operate excavators and backhoes and bucket loaders. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to be really challenged this summer to get the work done that we plan to do. We're already behind. And, you know, with three people, we're only going to be more behind. So my feeling is, yes, if you can find if you can find good people who are ready to come part time, let's hire them. Does anybody disagree with that? Nope. Okay. Good strategy. Use all, and, and I would I would go as far to say without without the CDL. Yeah, I I agree with that. I mean, I I think the CDL is a is a hurdle, and I agree with you, Randy. I think there are quite a few people who can operate heavy equipment who don't have CDLs. 
Okay. Anything else, Victor? Uh, just the Iona thing you got, Iona. Oh, yes, 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 yes. We uh, went went up there today and took a look at it. And uh, I think we found the cause of that. And uh, Shane and uh, uh, is heading up with, and, and gonna try to fix that tomorrow afternoon after he gets done with Baldock Road. So what, exa what exactly is the problem there? Is it the way we graded the road somehow? No, no, I don't believe so. I think it's, uh, uh, there's a driveway up above her house. I think it's actually her brother. She said, to <laughs> I called her and told her we were coming up tomorrow to do it. And uh, her chain was coming up. I, and uh, I think it's, I think it's the driveway is, uh, as it's described as uh, the driveway up above is, is, is uh, uh, we put, the town put some material in there, uh, I think a couple of years ago, and I think in the driveway, and I think that's causing some of the water to go towards her house instead of going across the road and down the ditch on the opposite side. Okay. And Whatever it is, it's the town's responsibility to fix it. I mean, it's our road that's causing the problem, not the driveway. Uh, I would not say that. I just want to be careful. And this, this harkens back to another old discussion. But, you know, when somebody gets a new driveway permit, we tell them they have to create the driveway such that the road, the water doesn't pour down the driveway and into the town road. But you can drive up and down our roads and they're, many, 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 many driveways that if they were built that way originally, they're not that way anymore. And the water's just sluicing down these driveways into the road and causing all kinds of problems. But uh, that's the issue there. But but without getting into too much detail here tonight, we will uh, we'll attempt. Shane and the boys will attempt to fix that tomorrow. And uh, if there's an issue, I'll get back to you. OK, that's good. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Yep. Dorinda. Yes. Um, first thing is the CV fiber commitment letter. Yep. That Sarah sent along. Um, and I don't know if anybody, you probably all read on front page forum, the other towns that have um, donated or are going to contribute. Yep. Um, some, so they're up. They were 153,000, and this will make them at 253. The other towns did 50,000, and one town did 53,000. That's what I saw, I guess. Yeah. This letter sounds fine to me. Okay, I think it's in your uh, in the yellow folder for you to sign, Peter. When yeah, I'll, you stop, down. I'll stop down tomorrow and sign it, unless anybody disagrees. Yeah, let's okay. let's make sure. Have we have we told them that we're doing this? So what happened was that I called, I contacted uh, uh, Jerry Diamond, I don't know, I'm Jerry Diamond Tades, Jerry Mitties, whatever his name is, from the CV, CV Fiber Board after I read that Front Porch Forum posting and said, hey, are you aware that uh, uh, Middlesex did this and I attached the draft minutes? And he sent back a draft letter from uh, Cabot and said, use this. So it was this letter that I based uh, your letter on. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think you guys need a motion for this because you've already approved it, right? You're already yep. Approved it. yep. Okay. Well, I'll stop down. I'll stop down tomorrow and sign it. Okay. The other thing I got was a bill in the mail from Main Street Law for, I guess, a conversation that you and John Riley had with review of Welch Park. Yes. Um, so that's four hundred and five dollars. Oh, it, it was not. It was not John Riley. I did not. No, it was. Bill come from? They the bill came from Main Street Law, and it was the work on matters review Welch Park deeds and government yes. documents. Yes. They had a phone conversation with John yes. Riley, and yes. then they had a phone conference with you. Yes, correct. And so the bill is four hundred. And five dollars. I yep. need authorization to pay it. And is this something that is just all absorbed by us? 
or how do, does this get split or well, how this, do, well do let me let me so let me let me tell you exactly what happened and then we can talk about it so this is this is our attorney who i contacted and said you know john riley cannot represent us in this he represents uh welch park the town needs to know how we can get out of welch park or dissolve welch park or whatever it is so it's our attorney billing us for the work he did to uh to work on that so i think that's all i think that's all us it's not welch park yep okay it wasn't rob who did the work peter i'm sorry what it wasn't rob yeah oh. yeah oh, okay. he's main street law oh they changed their name okay yeah, they changed their name from whatever it was, Patterson Walk and yeah. Bruce Allinger, Cameron and Lambeck or whatever, yeah. whatever it was. Yes, it's now yeah. mainstream. Okay. So anyway, this is this is our attorney working on our on our behalf, which which brings up another question. We need to decide how we wanna how we wanna move forward on that. And I did I did once again contact our fearless president and he was supposed to get back to me and he hasn't. So I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to him again. But there are ways there are ways for us to either dissolve Welch Park altogether, if that's the decision, or withdraw from Welch Park if the other members of Welch Park want to keep Welch Park going. And believe me, I am very motivated to bring this to a conclusion. Yes. Yeah. One way or the other. Okay. And last but not least, um, I sent you guys late this afternoon just um, those uh, summaries. Um, I didn't know what your thoughts were on it, if that's something you wanted to go with, if you wanted to me to add something, take something off of it, um, whatever, if you even wanted to move forward with it. But I did take the time to do it. I'm sorry, Dorinda, I did see that come in at like 4.22 or something, and I didn't yeah. get a chance to look at it. So can you yeah, I didn't get a chance okay. to look at it either. Okay. Then we'll table it for the next meeting or whatever. Well, is it something where you can just describe to us what it, what it is? Well, or? it was just, you mentioned at the last meeting that something about putting together something that showed the employee wages and all of their benefits and oh, okay. yep. where it shows what it all yep. came yep. out to and that potentially it would be something you might hand out at the beginning of the fiscal year or you know whatever if you were meeting with an employee I don't know you know like you talked about one time and potential employee reviews whatever you wanted to do but um so I put this together and I didn't know if that's what you were looking for or um whatever so that was more okay. or less for you to review okay. and let me know no that's great I'm sorry I didn't have it I was busy getting everything else together. I didn't have a chance to look at it, um, but I will, and I'll, okay. and I'll get back to you. But I like the idea of doing that. I just don't want to create a monster mm -hmm. amount of work for you guys. Well, it's all done. So that, I did it. For, my... So I did it for just the full-time employees because the other people are part-time. They have no benefits and there's no set hours for anybody. Right. So to do it for all employees just didn't really make right. any sense unless you just right. want to hand them a piece of paper. Um, but the template is done now. So no matter what happens, even if you were to hire in a new person, you could take this template and plug in, you know, however you're going to, whatever their wage was going to be, whatever. And you would have a document that would be show them this is you know how it all shakes out perfect i think that's exactly what we were looking for i think it looks good during the i like it yeah so i i i did have a chance to look it over um i was just curious i mean this is a quick exercise annually now that this template is built dorinda and it's basically it's 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 a plug-in whatever somebody's hired at you know, their hourly rate and whatever kind of negotiation process happens. But for existing employees, it's really just a matter of updating 
uh, hourly rates and stuff like that are in a transition year between the amount of PTO that they acquire and stuff like that. So it's not a long exercise. No, it's not. It, it, like I said, the template's there. Um, so the only, when you talk about like if it's a transition year, like there's one employee that's going to transition from one vacation level to a different vacation level during this next year. And so you just need to divide out how many weeks they're going to get paid at this category and how many weeks they're going to get paid at the new category. But other than that, it's just literally if you fill in the hourly wage and um, whatever category their vacation is, everything else remains the same because personal sick and holidays does not change per employee. Right. I like the idea of being able to hand it over on an annual basis and showing, showing them what their total compensation package looks like. Absolutely. I do too, because, you know, as, as much as we try and let them know what the cost of their benefits are, you know, until they see it on a piece of paper, they don't really understand what it is. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you no. have it for that and, you know, you can, you know, look at it and then do what you want if you want it handed out at July 1 or whatever. Okay. Thank you. Yep. That's all I think I have. Okay, thank you. Uh, we need to approve the minutes of our May 3rd select board meeting and our May 12th emergency meeting and probably we should do them separately, I think, because we had different people mm -hmm. involved. So how about a motion for the May 3rd minutes? Hey, Peter. Yes. Um, did everybody get those? When I looked at the email that was sent referencing the May 3rd meeting minutes, it showed December 7th meeting minutes. And I don't know if it was just me that, that maybe I missed one, but did that? I, I can send it to you again. I mean, I'm sorry that I don't, maybe I hit the wrong button, but I don't think so. I spent a lot of time in those. It was, I just, when I went to go I review them. I thought they were the right minutes when I, when I looked at them, but that yeah. was a while ago. Uh, I can send them to you right now, Randy, but it's a lot. It's why, a don't lot we, why don't we just, if, if he didn't have the right, right minutes, let's just pass over this for tonight and we can approve it at our next. Uh, okay. At our because next you, if Liz isn't here, then you can't approve the emergency meeting. Right. So we need to, right. We need to pass over that as well. Okay. Um, Sorry, guys. And no, no, no problem. And maybe I'm, maybe I was in a fog bank and I was reading the old minutes and I didn't even realize it. Who knows? I think, I think what Randy's confused by is that when I sent out the agenda for the May 3rd meeting, I included the December 7th minutes because of the um, because you guys were going to have a discussion about compensation and, and change. Right. So maybe that's what he's getting confused by. But it's also possible that I accidentally left Randy off sending off the minutes last time. So that might be it. Sorry, Randy. Let's, let's send them out again and We'll cover it at our next meeting. Thank you, Randy. Okay. Um, orders, we need to stop by and sign the orders and I've got that letter I need to sign. Um, update on, uh, I was actually thinking about this today, Sarah. Where are we on that FEMA buyout? So that is what this is about. Yeah. Okay. So just to fill in people like Randy who weren't here back then. In 2018, uh, Jennifer Evans, who lives at 28 Rich Road, was having a really bad ice jam problem on her driveway. And she, we, she, Rich Road is, comes off the end of Three Mile Bridge Road, and we had done a buyout of 191 and 195 Three Mile Bridge Road to hop and a skip from her. So uh, there are two structures on uh, Rich Road, and that is uh, Victoria Hallahan, who instead of being moved, had actually had her mobile home raised paid for by a separate, a third party organization. So she wouldn't have to uh, move so she could still live there and still be flooded. And then next to her is Jennifer Evans. And when I spoke to Jennifer that winter, I asked her about why didn't she participate in the tropical storm Irene uh, buyout. And she said, I don't know what the, is the issue was. I think maybe some things fell through when the prior clerk was here, whatever. We had, I think maybe six weeks to apply for that 
uh, tropical storm Irene FEMA buyout, and we made it under the wire in March of 2018. Did not hear anything from FEMA until right when the pandemic hit, I'd say March of 2020. And they said, good news, you've been awarded this buyout and here is how much money you will get. And the whole scheme is that I think it's 75% of federal money and then there's going, or 70% will be, the, the cost will be made up by federal money. And then 30% of the cost is made up by a third party person uh, organization. And believe me, there are plenty of third party organizations that want to give this money. So that would not necessarily have to come from Jennifer. The buyout is a multi-step process. It involves, first of all, the town actually acquiring the property and the town acquires the property for the appraised value, not the town appraised value, but whatever an appraisal say, appraiser says. The next step after that is once the town owns the property, they have to, we, we this is all coming from me, sends out uh, bids, RFPs for a pre, uh, asbestos, asbestos consultants. Those of the asbestos consultants must be rated according to minority owned and women owned businesses given preference and we create a, a spreadsheet and then I give that to the board and the board goes through and picks uh, um, an asbestos surveyor. That person comes back with the consultant comes back and says you do or do not have asbestos if like the last time you did have asbestos you then need to send out RFPs for asbestos contractors to remove the asbestos. That is also a process that must be very formal, must be done with following federal protocols. That contractor comes in, removes the asbestos. In the meantime, you're also sending out RFPs for someone to deconstruct not only the dwelling or and all the outbuildings, but also to dig up wire and electricity or septic. The whole idea is that you remove, you put everything back as it, into its natural state as possible, and then an easement is usually granted to something like the con to town or to the con that's maintained by the conservation commission, that therefore prevents any development from taking from building on that place ever again. The whole concept of this is that the federal government wants to wants to get rid of these properties, these dwellings that are in their in their flood zones. So here we are. 2020, right when this hit, was a bad time. We were just, you know, we, were, we had no staff. The office was closed. The first thing we did was we started, I started looking for appraisers. I got Marco Garcia after sending out informal RFPs to who said, who said he could come back with an appraisal of Jennifer Evans' property um, by July 31st, 2021. He got back October 20, 2021 because we have such delays. And when he also came back with that appraisal, the appraisal was $215,000 for a property that in our ta on our tax records is $102,000. So now I had to go back to FEMA and say, look at, we, you've given us an original award that doesn't even cost the price, that it doesn't even cover the price of this house. So they, uh, in March, FEMA returned with a letter saying, all right, we're gonna give you $77,000 more guaranteed um, and depending on what the deconstruction costs are, we'll consider, we'll consider perhaps giving you more. So now the total award is 259,100. That's not including all of the deconstruction costs, and that is also including the 30% the match. But um, the price of Jennifer's house is 215,000, which leaves us with $44,000 to do an asbestos survey and remediation. And just to give you a ballpark, the last time we had, uh, in 2014 to do the 191 and 195 asbestos removal. And that was two small patches, one on a roof, one in a sink. Uh, the bids were coming in at over $40,000. And we actually ended up hiring Jason Merrill to do the job at $20,000. And the state was not pleased, uh, but that's okay when we got a little bit of trouble. Um, so now we're dealing with, so we now we don't have much money, but to make the bottom line is that this project must be completed by July 31st, 2022. That's in X number of weeks. And uh, Stephanie Smith, who may or may not be in this conversation, I don't know, um, who is with uh, FEMA has said that we could get an extension if the board decides A, to commit to this project by June 1st, um, and commit also has made substantial progress. And that substantial progress would be the title search is done and completed on the property. The closing has happened and the asbestos survey has happened. And uh, my where I am right now as the person handling all of this as well as doing all my other duties 
is we're dealing with a pandemic backload that is, I, I mean, I think it's unprecedented and I'm also worried about the inflationary cost of materials. So I'm bringing this to you because I, I honestly don't see how we can possibly do this right now. And I don't want to gener dis disappoint Jennifer. I'm very, dis I'm, it's a very, very frustrating situation, but we're also, we're also kind of stuck. So that's where we are. So, so Sarah, this is Stephanie. Can I, can I jump in first? Yes. So hi, everyone. I apologize that I'm on the phone and so you can't see me, but this, I'm Stephanie Smith. I work at Vermont Emergency Management um, for the state and I manage the FEMA funding. Um, and just a couple of, of notes based on Sarah's comments. So that I just wanna make sure you guys are aware of while you're considering this, um, where things are now. So first, I'm, I am already requesting an extension to the deadline because there's another project under this round um, that needs an additional 15 months. So I am requesting an extension. Um, the absolute worst case scenario is that if we did run out of time, we would move this to a different funding round that I currently have open, where I have $11 million. So there's, there's plenty of money. And that, if we did have to move it, it wouldn't mean anything on your end. It would only be that FEMA would have to update things on their end. So it wouldn't impact you guys at all if we had to move it to this other funding round. But when we're running out of time, sometimes FEMA tells us they don't want to extend our period of performance for a particular round because it's so old and they want to close it. So in this case, we have an additional $11 million round, so we could very easily move it into that. Um, and in terms of the demo costs, as, as long as the scope hasn't changed, there's no reason why we would not get additional funding approved from FEMA um, to cover if that overrun. The reason FEMA didn't approve additional costs for construction now is because we don't have an RFP. We haven't done an RFP, we haven't hired someone yet, but if we get bids back and they're high, they would give us additional funding and we wouldn't have to stop work. We could keep going and finish the, the demolition. So I, I, I don't think time is the issue and I don't think money is the issue either. I, I also spoke to to Jen Evans yesterday, um, and she she's definitely still interested uh, in the project. So at this point, the next step is that our office develops a security transaction agreement that includes the financials from the appraisal so that we're outlining how much funding Jen would get through the project. And that document needs to be signed by the town um, and by the property owner. And then once that's executed, the town attorney can pull the title to do this search um, and start developing the document. So the only thing that I'm missing to create that voluntary transaction agreement is the, is the field description of the project deed. Um, so once I have that from the town, I can get that. Um, and I already. You're going out, Stephanie. And she's still. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. You were breaking okay. up. So I, oh, I apologize. Um, so I. I, I don't think it's an issue, and I and I know that time has been a challenge for you guys. And I know Sarah's been very busy, so I'm I don't see it as a concern. Those are that's that's just my input, though. Hey, Stephanie, can I ask you? Go would, ahead, sir. Would this uh, would that uh, transaction would that agreement have to be signed by someone in the board by uh, June first? No. Okay. No, so I just, Sarah, all I need from you, Sarah, is that legal description of the property, and then I can finalize that so you guys can take a look at it and, and get it signed. Okay. Steve, I see various people raising their hands. Steve or Randy? Go ahead, Steve. Oh, you're muted. I, I was just curious that the 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 town is the town going to be uh, liable for any money in this no the town will not be liable for any money there's there's a twenty thousand um, dollar grant from the vermont disaster recovery fund and the rest there we have a well it's it was coming through two rivers um the two rivers regional planning commission who's been managing match for buyouts in the state um, and then we also have a general fund allocation that was just approved that we'll be using for match for future projects. So there's plenty of match funding. Yeah, our, our premise in this, Steve, since we started is that we would work this out so there was no cost for the town. That, that was my question as well, was what kind of liability does the town have 
uh, financially. Um, and if we take, if, if the process is we have to take ownership of this before we know what some of these additional demo costs or the asbestos cost or the demo and all that kind of stuff, it sounds like there's a, there's not a concern on Stephanie's uh, end as far as the additional money, but it doesn't sound like there's any real guarantee that we're 100% covered either. It's a, I, I would tell you, Randy, having been through this process a couple of times before, it's a little bit of a leap of faith, maybe, maybe more than a, more than a little, but it has worked out in the past. Well, and, and I'll tell you, it's out of that 11, the 11 million dollars that we have right now, we, we haven't even closed that application round isn't closing until November or potentially February if I get a little additional time. So there's no reason, I don't see any reason why we would not get additional funding if it was needed. If we had an asbestos quote that came back that was 40,000, we would do an overrun and we would pay for it. Okay. Sarah. So I just want to let the board know that this is all new to me. I did not know about the $11 million funding round. And, um, and uh, as long as we got it in the notes and we've got Stephanie on the record and you guys are well aware of what's going on, as long as I'm not the person making this decision, but the the board is making this decision, you know, I'm, I'm okay to execute it. I just don't want to be the person who's responsible for making a decision. Understood. Yes, Dorinda. Are we going to be able to find the contractors needed to pursue this project? Because I'll tell you, there is, you know, I've got two brothers in the construction field and they're way, way out in, and the costs for everything is up 35, 40% and they're out months. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, long time out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we've, we've definitely seen delays with some of the other projects and that's, that's another reason why it might it might end up making more sense just to move it under that other funding round so that we know we have enough time if it takes a year or whatever it is to actually get to the demo. Randy? I, I was just going to ask Stephanie what the, you know, what the timeline for deciding whether it was moved into this other one and then and then what is the execution timeline for this next round of funding that you're talking about? Yeah, so it's it's funding that's specific to the state. So we could, if we moved it now, we could continue the project now. We wouldn't have to wait. Um, and I, for on my end, I'm because I'm submitting the uh, the extension request to FEMA for this round of funding that this project's currently under anyway. Um, I would probably wait to see if FEMA approves that, and if they do, whether we think we'll have enough time. And if we're worried that we won't, then we would then we could move it. So does that, does that make sense? Know, this, is a, this, is a, this is a frustrating process. I think we all, all agree, and I'm sure it's frustrating for you, Stephanie, but um, we, are, we are in it now, and I think we need to continue to go ahead. But I don't know how others, yeah. I don't know how others feel. Yes, Phil. I, I agree, uh, Peter. I, I think it makes sense to move to the next round of funding uh, just because the timelines are just way too short for, for us to you know, get anything done here at this point. So I'm, I'm certainly in favor of continuing to pursue this, but would prefer to move it into that next round of funding. I'd like to see it all work out. Like I said, the, the big concern for me was the financial liability to the, to the town if something fell through. Um, so it sounds like you've been down this road before and, and things have a way of working themselves out. But that's that's my my biggest concern looking into this and, and being new to the process. So well it is it's a it's especially at this time when it's so high hard to hire contractors and prices are escalating faster than any of us can keep track of. But um, I can promise you, I won't be signing any orders for any checks from the town, no matter what happens. We'll just stop the process. Well, it's a reimbursement grant, like all federal things. So you have to be pay up front. Yeah, no, I know. 
but we yeah, want but we won't we won't insurance before before we commit that we're gonna that we're gonna get reimbursed is all I'm saying. Right, and the actual home purchase, you don't have to front that. We would cut you a check for that piece. Everything else is reimbursement based. But if for some reason you you don't have the ability to pay for something or you want to request that we pay it up front, we can do that. You just have to go through a request process for it. Great. Well, I think as long as as long as we 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 have we have you and we have it in the record and on the record that the money's there to reimburse us. I don't, I don't think that's an issue, but um, I, I certainly understand your concern, Randy. This is a different kind of a process than anything we normally do. So I guess yeah, and, and for what? Point, well, just let me finish, Stephanie. I I don't know uh, whether we need whether we need a motion to continue the process, whether we can just agree as sense of the board that we're continuing the process and see how it goes. Um, Dorinda, you'd probably like a motion, right? We don't. We it's not. It's warned for no action, so I'm not sure. Okay, well we could we could. We can I take think, action at our next meeting. Yeah. Yeah, I think I am going to get Stephanie this uh, property description, and then she can. Um, I'm just going to send her the deed from Jennifer Evans's place, and then she can uh, draw draw up with the document, and then you guys can vote on the document and approve right. it on the seventh. Yeah. yeah. So Jennifer, I see you are you are here listening in. Do you have any questions or comments about this? You're part of this, obviously. Yeah. No, I'm just frustrated because we've had this conversation over and over again. Well, I understand, but we're doing the best we can do. So what's your pleasure, board members? We're gonna consider this, we can't take action tonight. So I guess we're gonna consider this at our next meeting. Right. Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, trash on Portal and Bulldog Roads. Um, I got a call from our, uh, what's his title, Sarah, help me out. Rob. A health officer. A health Rob officer. Penny. Thank you. Thank you. I'm bringing it tonight uh, about this problem of a gigantic pile of pile of trash. Uh, not the not the property we've had the problem with before. This is a property slightly down the road across from the North Branch Cemetery, and he did send me photos, but he sent me the photos like five minutes before our meeting started. But I will forward along uh, those photos so you can all see them. But there's a gigantic pile of trash there. And uh, he's been negotiating with the property owner whose name is Sarah? Marinville. Marinville. Marinville, M-A-R-A-N-B-I-L-L-E. Yeah, his niece is the one who is, is living there. And he uh, made a commitment to clean, up the, to clean up this trash over the course of the summer at two bags of trash a week, which Rob considered to be a a joke, basically. He said it'd take a year to clean up that pile of trash uh, at two bags, at two bags per week. And he also said he thinks it's really not a health issue. He said, you know, is there some chance if there's garbage there and there are animals getting into the garbage, maybe it be could become a health issue. But he considers it to be uh, to be a trash issue. So. Uh, and I will I will forward along these pictures to look for you to see. But it's a gigantic uh, it's a gigantic pile of all kinds of stuff from dead snow blowers to piles of garbage to whatever. I think we I think we follow our our junk ordinance and send out the first firmly worded letter to him and try and get him on a short leash to get it cleaned up. I mean, literally, literally, somebody needs to go in there with a with some kind of bucket loader or, or something and get a, a big dumpster and fill it up and get that stuff out of there. Okay. Thoughts? Yes, agreed. So Sarah, if you will, if you will craft that letter, I will, uh, I will sign it and we'll start the process. I mean, as you all know, when we've had these situations in the past, we've always tried to resolve them through uh, through increasingly firm 
uh, letters. We have never gotten to the we have never gotten to the ticket process. But here we go. Here we go again, starting down the starting down the road. But we do need to take action. I just want to say that Robert Bauer seems to be on our um, is, seems to be listening in, and we've sent him letters uh, onto about his Route 12 property. And uh, I'm not sure if you guys are satisfied with the action that's taken place. They still get complaints about it. Well, I would tell you, I, I drive by there three or four times a week and I can't see that it's been substantially improved, but he's, he's the tenant, not the owner of the property, right? It's no, he, he owns the, he owns the, he owns the structure and uh, Downstreet owns the land underneath the structure. Yeah. He's but not a tenant. The problem is on the land, not with the structure, I believe, right? That's all. I don't, I don't know what, the, I don't know how we should proceed, but. <laughs> I did see in the paper that Downstreet has a new executive director, so um, maybe we should stir them up with a letter. And uh, Robert, if you have any comments about this, we'd love to hear from you, but we're frustrated that that uh, situation continues to exist with very little improvement. Nope. Not there. Okay. So I would say we have we have two letters to uh, <laughs> two letters to send out and follow up on. Okay. Uh, correspondence. Uh, no. Okay. I have I have one other just very quick thing. Um, I've been working with the Dan Stan folks about a couple of uh, a couple of issues. Um, the the relative easy easy one I think is that they want to build at their expense a small eight by 10 foot storage building to be sited at the upper end of the, uh, of the uh, bandstand site up against the woods to store a bunch of their miscellaneous uh, stuff in. That, that this material uh, has been stored in John Puglio's barn and he's no longer on their board and he would like the stuff out of his barn and they don't really have any other place to put it. Also, from the point of view of convenience, every time they have a concert, they have to go up and get the stuff and then take it back up there and it would be nice just to have it have it on the on the premises. Um, assuming assuming we're okay with this. I would I would ask them just to give us a sketch of what it's going to be a eight by ten foot building with a door, no windows, and a, and a pitched roof, not a one plane roof, to be stained uh, some dark color, gray or brown or or something, so it fits in with a fits in with the tree line. Anybody have any issues or concerns about that, Steve? No. Just just as long as we pre-approve whatever they're going to build right well i'm going to ask them i'm going to ask them for a sketch of exactly exactly what it's going to be yes torenda what if they used uh framed off a portion of the old fire station inside like against you know one of the walls or something then they wouldn't have to build another structure well that i i asked him about i asked him about that i said you know you could put a three wall like lean to shed on the side of the old uh, of the old town garage. He I was, was thinking he wasn't, inside. he wasn't enthusiastic about about that. This is this is to be done at their expense. And I, I also think we would uh, we would ask him to sign an agreement that if it ever fell into disrepair or out of use that they would remove it. They're not asking they're not asking for town money to do it. They're just asking for permission to put it there. Peter, I also asked mean? a question about potentially. I I don't know, and uh, uh, we've lost we've lost Victor, but the town still maintains control of one bay uh, in that old garage, and I didn't know if some of the stuff just couldn't be stored in there. But that was what I was thinking. You uh, know, even if they made locked made a three sided there inside. Right, right, but the question is. Well, there are a couple of there are a couple of questions. I don't know how the I don't know how the road crew would feel about that. We can find out, um, but I'd rather have them be responsible for their own stuff and not be in and out of our building. I mean, the the lean to on the side made a little sense to me, but 
I don't know. Yes, Randy. Uh, are, are they thinking like more of like a permanent structure was set up on piers or something, or are they thinking about like a movable? No, it's not movable. Be dropped in place? Be on, it's, they're, they're thinking of putting down, putting down a, uh, a, a gravel pad and putting cement blocks or some kind of concrete blocks and it would sit on that. It's just a storage building, no electricity, no plumbing, no. Yeah, I mean, an eight, an eight by 10 shed, I mean, you know, really you could back a trailer up to that thing if it's not connected to piers or something and right. get it out of there if it was ever an issue. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, I think it does make sense to have a written agreement saying if it ever falls out of use or out of repair that they'll, that they'll uh, remove it. Okay. So I will I will ask him to send us a sketch to uh, sketch to look at, and we can also think about uh, Dorinda's ideas at the same time. I'll I'll talk to uh, I'll talk to Victor about potentially using some space in the building. I'm just a little reluctant to have random people having having keys to that. I mean, I think we keep don't we keep the grader in there in the winter time? Yeah, but is there anything on the other side, the fire department side? I don't yeah. even know if they store a truck in there anymore. There are two trucks. There are two trucks in there. Oh, there is two. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, well. No, I did a little. I did a little survey of the premises when I when I was oh, over okay. the meeting with them just to just to take a look at it. Um, you know, the other this, this is just a side thing, and I I did send an email to Shane, and I got a response from him. But I was so I was over there looking at this, and I was surprised to see that the gate uh at our town garage was wide open all weekend long three days and also that bay in the garage was wide open it wasn't even locked and shane said well maybe it was maybe it was casella who left the gate open I, I said well i don't know but i when nobody's around for three days the whole purpose of that gate is to have it locked so people can't go back there so anyway not a big deal but a concern yes yeah, I was over. I was over there on Thursday afternoon, and the gate was open. Um, I talked with Victor about it. He talked with Shane, and it sounded like uh, Charles was supposed to go back down and close the gate uh, for Casellas after Casellas had come. So maybe maybe that just didn't take place. I don't know. But the thing that I was trying to mention that I did want to mention was um, uh, Robert Bowers did type some stuff into the chat here, um, saying that he doesn't have. The capability to have audio on here oh okay um he said that uh in the chat here it says uh he's lost his brother has had a bilateral pulmonary embolism and survives on ssdi pickup has been broken down for over 10 weeks fell working on all of it when he fell in severely bruised ribs so well, all all I would say, and maybe we can maybe we can reach out to him with a with a letter and ju and just say, you know, that this has been ongoing for years. I mean, those those may be his current list of problems, but this is ongoing for years. So, you know, somehow and it, periodically he's got he's got stuff sticking out into the state right away. I would think the state would get after him, but anyway, I feel badly that that's the situation he's in, but. Uh, there was there was a whole other laundry list of excuses the last time we uh, we pursued this. So uh, I will get a, I will get a sketch for that little uh, for that little building and uh, also reach out to the road crew and see how they feel about some of the stuff being stored and uh, you know creating. I mean I I I suggested I, it, I I can't remember the gentleman's name Bafa I think was the fellow I was meeting with. I said you could even just put a fence up in there with a with a you know padlock on it just so your stuff didn't didn't walk away but uh if there was if there was room in the back that's a pretty big space that bay but i imagine with the grater in there it might be pretty tight i don't know but i'll i'll find out i'll find out the other issue with the other issue with the bandstand is um they're concerned that our that our sign there is falling into disrepair well it has it has fallen a little bit into disrepair i talked to mitch Mitch knows the person who created the sign. He's going to see if they can't if they can't fix it up. It's a little delaminated and it has a little peeling paint. But at the same time, I I brought up to Elliot Berg the fact that they created 
an ugly two by four frame, which they have there, which they hang their sign on in the, in the, in the summertime. And I said, so you're concerned about a little peeling paint on our sign. And yet you leave that ugly frame there, which I think is a lot worse year round. And he said, well, you're right. We should probably remove it, blah, blah, blah. I, I said, listen, Elliot, what I want to do is I'm, I'm going to get a hold of Mitch um, and I'm going to have him communicate with you and explore the idea of you hanging your sign onto the bottom of our sign so that we have one sign and you can take it down at the end of the season and boom, it's gone. Well, Elliot went crazy and said, well, it's not big enough. There's not enough space. There's not this, there's not that. I said, listen, Elliot, I asked Mitch to contact you and resolve this. If the two of you can't resolve it, get back to me. This to me is a minor problem and it's easily rectified. But yep. Elliot is very challenging to deal with. We'll see how Mitch does and I'll get, uh, I'll get back in touch, but the bandstand, the bandstand committee is a, is a challenge. Elliot in particular is just challenging to deal with. It's, his heart's in the right place, but he's challenging to deal with. And that is all I have. Thank you. Anything else, anyone? Uh, okay. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all very much. Have a good evening. See you in a couple weeks. Good evening. Good night.